Okay, well, thank you again, everyone, for joining. I'm going to preface this by saying this talk is about contracts, which means uh, some of it's kind of boring, but I'm going to try and make it as interesting and to the point as possible. I'm hoping that uh, this part of the talk uh, especially can be a little bit of a resource for people later on. I know this might not be the perfect time in the year for everyone that's uh, looking to sign a contract, but <clears throat> most of the stuff here is relatively generic and should be good for a couple of years. Um, this is the uh, very important disclaimer. I am not an attorney. This is not legal advice for anyone that's watching this. This is just to help you have a generic understanding of how a contract is structured. If you're like me, outside of the contracts you sign at the beginning of your residency that we all, to be honest, either don't read or don't care about because let's face it, you match there, you're gonna go there, you're gonna do that residency. This is really like the first contract a lot of people sign and sign electively. So we're gonna kind of go over how things are structured and things that I think you should care about um, in terms of things you should negotiate for and, and all that. <clears throat> so at the very beginning of the contract, any contract, if it's a good one, it's gonna have this stuff that I call the preamble at the beginning. And it's a bunch of legalese that you should absolutely read, but just so you know, most of this stuff is pretty boilerplate in terms of what do you need to maintain to hold up your end of being eligible for the contract? Like you gotta have a valid license in that state. Some places will say you need to be board eligible or board certified, or they'll have some exception if you're part of <clears throat> a foreign medical grad program. Um, and then things that disqualify you. Some of this can be interesting. So they can have things like, you know, even in a state where marijuana, for instance, is legal, they could have in there that a failed drug test for THC could disqualify you. Almost all of them have a felony uh, conviction or sometimes they'll say things like a, a misdemeanor with moral turpitude is what most of them say. And what they're really getting at there is that's some, something like a DUI. Um, and you got to think of these things as things that you shouldn't do in general. But for things like a failed THC drug test, like that's probably more there because that gives the employers cause if they need it, if there's some reason to look for cause. Uh, but anyway, you should be aware of what all of those stipulations are. And then my little tidbit on this slide, which is courtesy of my contract attorney who was super helpful, is uh, talking about the ability to cure. And what that means is if you make a mistake somewhere and you make somebody mad, or it turns out you haven't been signing your op notes for like six months because you didn't know you had to go into some bucket to sign them. What you want in your contract is the ability to cure a problem, which means when they tell you about it, you're given a reasonable amount of time to make things right before they can just say, oh, look, you made this person mad, you're gone, or you didn't sign these for six months, you're gone. So having the ability to cure is helpful and it's something you should argue for in your contract. And they're not gonna argue against that because that's reasonable. Um, <clears throat> you need, they're going to talk to you about what outside work is in your contract and outside work in general is anything that you're not doing in the office or in the hospital for that group, <clears throat> but it can mean a lot of different things technically and legally. And those things can be everything from moonlighting or doing locum shifts or covering the ER as an ER doctor in some tiny hospital, if you wanted to do that. Or it can even mean consulting work that you do for a device company or non-medical stuff. And you want to make sure that it defines this appropriately so that stuff that has nothing to do with your work with the group is not something they can claim uh, or make any claims to financially or otherwise or prohibit you from doing. So it's important that that's clearly defined in your contract. Um, and then I have another little thing about consulting there because it's relatively common in spine surgery is you wanna make sure that it clearly outlines what you can and can't do. You know, does the orthopedic or neurosurgery or spine group let you consult? And if so, are they someone who just says, yep, it's fine, we don't need to know anything? Do they wanna look at all the contracts or what they're allowed to look at in the contract, which is a whole nother thing? Um, <clears throat> or are they saying, well, we want a cut of that? Um, all those things are pretty important to know. Obviously I'm biased as a surgeon myself. I don't think the group should get money from my own consulting, but you should make sure that it says that. Because um, otherwise, if it's not written down, then you don't know for sure that that's how it's going to be structured for you. And it sounds really pessimistic to say, but if it's not written down in the contract, you should assume that when things go south and someone wants to pull out the contract, it's not going to work well for you. So you just want to make sure everything's written down that you need to be written down. Um, and then my little caveat here for the university setting is if you're going to work in academics, uh, just understand that intellectual property is owned by the center. I mean, you're going to own a percentage of it, but I mean, it can be as high as 80 or 90 percent at some of these places that they own in terms of patents and IP. So uh, to get around that, you need to have a whole nother attorney to help you with those things or just avoid that situation. 
Um, <clears throat> another thing I'm going to touch on here probably too briefly for the topic itself, but is the idea of multiple contracts. Uh, this is the setting that I'm in, and I know plenty of other surgeons that are in a similar setting. And this is where you sign a contract with a group, but you can also sign a, a recruiting contract. And that's frequently with a hospital or healthcare system where they're helping to bring you to the area and they're helping to maybe assure your pay for a year or two. And in exchange, they get you doing cases at their hospital. The risk is that they're paying extra money to get you there. And the group is excited to have that because they get some help in assuring your salary without dipping into their coffers. If you do this, one of the important things to understand that I really didn't go into it is this idea of like a non-compete. Non-compete or a restrictive covenant, you know, says areas where you cannot practice, right? If you're a, with a group as an employee or a partner and they have a non-compete that says, you know, within 20 miles of our main headquarters, if you leave the group or we fire you or whatever, then for a year, you can't operate within this bubble unless yada, yada, yada. Maybe it's, you got to pay a certain amount of money to end the non-compete or whatever. The hospital recruiting contract kind of works the other way around. It requires that you have the ability to work within their bubble and they structure that differently. They might say the three zip codes that make up 90% of our income or whatever it is, or 90% of our patient volume, that's where you have to have the ability to operate with them. So since those two could potentially conflict each other, one of them has to supersede the others. And typically the case here, uh, of course, you should clarify in your situation, but typically the case is the uh, hospital recruiting contract supersedes the group contract, um, which means that that group contract, that, that portion of it will either kick in later or you will sign a new one at that point in time. Um, so that's just kind of an interesting thing. Uh, the point of the recruiting contract, either through a hospital or even sometimes through the same group, is they're going to want to provide you with a salary guarantee, which um, you know we'll talk about more in a minute too, but essentially says that you're going to get paid like you have a salary, even if you're in a private group that typically functions on eat what you kill model, because um, they're trying to support you while you're building up. And then when you get to that next stage, whether it's a year, 18 months, two years, whatever you guys agree on, you would then convert to your other earning model. Um, <clears throat> in terms of call coverage and patient flow, this is another thing that doesn't really get talked about a lot, at least amongst my friends. What I think happens is you interview and when you go on these interviews, you have a phone call and then you go to dinner and then you might have drinks after that. And somewhere between like the fourth and sixth drink, someone brings up that, you know, I really like fixing ankle fractures. And then you say, yeah, that's great. You can have them all. And ha ha, we all laugh. And then you leave. And like, guess what? That doesn't mean anything, not literally nothing. So what you got to make sure is when someone calls, whether it's their primary care doctor sends them, or they come in from the ER when no one in your group was on call, when someone calls, who determines where they go and what's the algorithm they use? Is it the front office person who's known your partner for 20 years and someone just called with the best insurance in town? Because if so, and there's no algorithm, you're not getting that patient, right? You're going to get the next three Medicaid patients and your partner's going to get the best payer. And I know ethically we shouldn't care about that. And that's great and all, but you still got bills to pay and you can't ethically practice medicine if you can't open the doors to your group. So it's important to know how this is determined. Is it every other patient? Is it only when you're on call? Do you send all the foot and ankle stuff to the foot and ankle guy and they send all the spine stuff to you? Like, how does that work? So you want to spell that out. And that might not be on the first dinner, but it should definitely be before you sign the paper. So then other things like, here is general ortho, like I talked about there, if you're an ortho group, uh, if you're in a spine group, then it could be just the random calls coming in from the primaries. And then the internal referral stuff is also important. If I'm in an ortho group and there's two spine guys here. So when the foot and ankle guy needs a spine surgeon, is he just sending it to the one or the two of us that he likes better or that he thinks needs, you know, is better at that problem or is it random or, you know, it's, there's no right or wrong answer in that situation. You just want to know what to expect with the internal referrals. Um, and then there's the call stuff. This is wildly different everywhere. And I definitely don't have the time in one talk to cover all this stuff, but there's really two types of call. There's group call, which is like I'm answering phone calls from a patient at home on a Saturday or in the evening. And then there's call for the ER. You know, I've got to either go in or admit a patient to me or to the hospitalist in my name or things I'm responsible for operatively. And typically you try and overlap those as much as you can so that people that are off can truly be off. But what you want to know is what's the frequency? Is it distributed evenly? You don't want the senior partner to never take call and you're taking call every third day unless there's some financial incentive for you to do that. And then you want to know in terms of like holidays and things like that, 
it'd probably be great if the new guy or the youngest surgeon didn't work on all the holidays because you don't know how long you're going to be the youngest surgeon for. So you want to make sure that the group has some fairness built in ahead of time. And if, if they're telling you that, they shouldn't be afraid to put it in the contract. If they say, well, that's how we always do it. Great. Put it in the contract. Right. That's not hard. Then there's nothing to be afraid of there. And that can be your last bullet point when you're negotiating. But that's an easy thing for them to put in if they're really not afraid of that. Um, and then the last thing here is if you have general ortho partners and you're taking general call, are they going to help you out with stuff? Um, I could get on a soapbox, but I'm not going to about the spine thing. And that's that, you know, if one of my patients comes in on Saturday and has a superficial wound draining from a one level landing. You know how many of my ortho partners are going to take that to the OR? Zero. And if you're in a general ortho group, I'm willing to bet that it's the same for you. But if one of my partners has a knee that comes in that's draining or a shoulder that's draining, I mean, I take that to the OR if I'm on call, right? I call them, but I take care of it. So since I'm going to do those things uh, and I feel like I'm doing a little extra, I want to make sure that especially if I'm on call and some blown apart, you know, periarticular distal, you know, or distal humerus fracture or something comes in that my shoulder elbow guy is going to be able to take care of that or should. Um, so you want to kind of work out the flow of those patients and make sure you know what the rules are going to be. Are you expected to fix a tab because you're taking some level one call or are you going to be able to put it on ice for the trauma person? Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to give you the information of the, on my last slide from my contract attorney, who I think is just a total baller. Um, but a lot of this information for this slide I got from him, and that's because I gave him an offer letter. I was like, hey, what do you think of this offer letter? Should I sign this, you know, to get to the contract stuff? And he was like, absolutely not. And he, and this was before I knew him. And he said, you're going to get to know me better, but I'm just going to tell you now the answer is no. Um, and here's why. And he basically what he said is, yeah, it's going to have these numbers on it, but they're totally out of concept. Right? Like there's a reason my contract was like 17, 18 pages because there's that much information they care about. So they could put these numbers and say, hey, we're going to pay you a million dollars a year. And you're like, oh, yeah, this is great. And you sign it. And then the contract's like, but you have to take call every single day. And if you don't, you have to pay it all back by Thursday. Like, so you don't know what the contract's going to say. The problem is it's not legally binding if you sign the offer letter, but it is in, in a negotiating sense, a huge landslide victory for the other side. It makes it very challenging for you to claw back at things because they're going to say you're not negotiating in good faith either out loud or they will use that indirectly. So one of the things he said, I have in the green thing at the bottom here, which I think is super awesome to, to have in, in terms of context, 500 physician contracts he's done three times in negotiating. Have they ever had an offer pulled? And all three of them was because the physician signed the offer letter and then tried to slide the amount because of the terms. And the, in his opinion, the physician was reasonable in doing so. But the people they were negotiating with were like, no, you signed it. It's too much. We, we don't want to move off of that. We are only here because you agreed to that, blah, blah, blah. So the long and short or the long and long is don't sign the offer letter. You can use it as a general tool. But if they're willing to give you that, say, this looks promising. Can you send me the whole contract and take a look at the whole thing? Um, next thing. Try not to get too bogged down, but as overhead, it's something we don't think about much as residents and fellows, but it's the cost of doing business quite literally. So it's, you know, how are you paying for the electric bill? How are you paying for the medical assistant? How are you paying for the health insurance for the people in your group? And then depending on how you do your accounting, if you're in a private group, it's also your own salary potentially is included in your overhead on the business side. Um, and this is one of the benefits to being an academic or an employed physician is that you don't necessarily, it's not that you don't think about this, but it doesn't directly impact your pay as much because your pay is either salary based with a bonus or salary without or somehow incentive driven, but it's not, you're not worried about what other people are getting paid as much. Um, the, the general ways this can be arranged is there's the fixed percent, which basically to pay all the staff and turn on to say that overhead is 60% one. And, uh, you know, that's how we're going to determine it. Um, so that's, in my opinion, not great, because if you earn more, you pay a whole lot more. But there are groups that do that. Um, that can be pretty heavily taxing for spine surgeons. And you might kind of float the other surgeons making less than you. But again, I don't have time to get into that. But that's possible. The other option is, a fixed amount where they say, look, we divided this up and we know how much each clinic's going to cost. And we think that your total overhead for the year is going to be 25,000 for this example, which would be low, but let's say that's what it is. Uh, I'm sorry, 25,000 a month. And that's what you're going to pay every month. And if you earn over that, you earn, you get to keep everything over that. And so in the first year, you might not be hitting that target. 
but five years in, that's basically how you determine what you make and you eat what you kill model. It would be, do you make 50,000? Great. Then you get to keep 25 and you pay 25 to pay the bills. If you made 60,000 this month and next month, you're going to take a week off, then maybe you expect to make 45 because that's a week of not making money. Um, and then at the bottom there is just kind of a different options with, is there a base salary where they give you your base? And then once you collect up to your base and the overhead, then they either start paying you after that for your bonus money, or there's a dead zone where the group makes some money and they're basically offsetting the risk and you not covering uh, for their money there. And then you get paid a percentage over the top of that. And then there's the academic model, but is also a model at a lot of employed hospitals where there's a base salary, but an RVU target or a collections target. And when you earn to that or over that, you start bonusing and getting a percentage based on the tier. So that's your drive to do more work, even though you're salary. Um, and then, so for compensation, all I'll say about the MGMA is I would look at it if you can, it gives you an idea of the percentages of uh, the percentile of pay across the country in different specialties. Do not expect in your first job, like, oh, I should be middle of the road. Like that is for all spine surgeons in the country that are 30 years out, one year out, and it's all compensation together, signing bonus, all, all this stuff together. Um, so it just gives you an idea of what some of the numbers are. Like you should probably not be in the 1%, right? But if you're 10 to 20% in your first job in your first year, I mean, that's great. So um, you should also know that it's very different based on location, which you're also probably uh, well aware of. Um, other things that you should care about in your contract. Remember almost everything in the contract is negotiable. So you have, yeah, the annual compensation or, you know, if you're getting paid by RVU or if you're trying to say, I want this guarantee for my first year, that's negotiable, but so is a signing bonus. You know, do you want some money for signing the contract or signing the contract? And then you get some when you actually start working as a commencement bonus. There's loan assistance where you can say, hey, I want $30,000 for my student loans over the next couple of years. And, you know, that type of thing. Relocation, uh, obviously to pay for your move. You should know what the call pay is. If there's not call pay, then, um, you know, that's an option. It's nice when there is and you're actually paid to take call. So even if the patients you take care of don't have insurance, you're still getting compensated somehow. Um, and then in the group, is there potential for ancillary income if you become a partner? Is the group something you can buy into? Do they have a hospital or do they have a DME that they sell or physical therapy? Do they own an MRI? Things like that, that the other partners at the time are making some extra money off of is something you can view as an ancillary income stream in the future for yourself. And then things like surgery center or hospital buy-in, you want to know what the state and local laws are for that. And one of the best ways to know is to ask the future partners, are they investing in surgery centers? Is that something in the area that's common? And does it do well for them? You know, by the third or fourth time you meet some of these people, you don't need to know the exact numbers for things like that, but you can ask it like that. Are you doing well? Is it worth your time? And if they say, yeah, it's great, or it's mailbox money paying for my kid's private school or everything, great. It gives you an idea of where you're potentially going. free what's the benefits like you know it might be expensive but is it covering everything you want do they offer an hsa can you get a research assistant if you're uh, into that and then for time stuff is do you get paid vacation if you're salaried paid vacation is a real thing so you want to know how much of it you get and then if you're especially in the academic world do you have protected academic time or are they going to ask you to do all these extra things until you figure it out and then you're doing it on the evenings or on a saturday and if you want the academic time, again, like make sure it's in the contract. You get a day a week or half a day a week or whatever it is you need to do, what it is you're expected to do. Um, so this is kind of a private practice look real quick, but I think it's helpful for a lot of people is when you start working, you're not making as much as you cost, right? That's how they, they're paying you extra money so that you can feel like you're getting out of debt a little bit with the rest of the world, but you're probably going to go in debt to the group for a while to do that. There's a billion different ways to do this, but I want to familiarize you guys with a general structure of kind of how debt can work. So um, you want to ask how this is going to work in the beginning. So if I make a thousand dollars, but then I get paid, you know, 30,000, like what is that other 29,000? Where does that go? When do I have to pay it? What's the interest on it? Uh, and they should give you a and l um, which is basically a sheet. It's a projection for like the year for you for how much money you're going to make. Uh, what are you going to bring in? How many RVUs are you going to do? Or cases do they think you're going to do? And what are your costs going to be? And it should give you an idea of what's reasonable to pay yourself, how much debt you'll go into during that time. 
And uh, it's, it's very helpful to look at for someone like myself who at the time had, hadn't seen one yet. Um, and then things like, where's call pay gonna happen if you're getting paid for that? Do you get paid on your own? Does it get applied towards your debt? Does it go through the group, stuff like that? And then a really important thing in your contract is, let's say you still owe 50,000 to the group because you're two months in and you know, didn't make a ton of money yet. And the group terminates you without cause because they decide like, well, we're done with that. What happens to your debt then? Because it'd be a real shame if you had to pay it back and you only had the ability to earn the money to do that. So those are things you want to look at in the contract. So I'm going to give you a quick math example. I promise this will be like three, eh, probably be five minutes, but uh, I just want you guys to be able to follow the dollar. And this is like a shell game that I really encourage you guys to do. If you're getting near the end of a contract with someone, ask them this, be like, well, let's run through a month and let's say this and let's assume this and just see where things go to make sure nothing comes out of the blue. So here's an example of you're joining a private practice, no hospitals helping, you're just joining the private practice and you decide that, or they decide or you decide together, they're gonna to salary you at 360 a year and your overhead's 25,000 a month and it's starting in month one. Well then, okay, so every month my liability is 55,000. I gotta pay myself and I gotta pay the overhead. And let's say month one, you just crush it. And I mean crush it for month one and collect 15,000. I don't know how you're doing that, but you somehow make 15,000 in the first month. Well, you're 40,000 under what you owe. So essentially what that means is they'll let you pay yourself your salary and they gotta pay your overhead for you and you're now in debt to the group 40,000, right? Because you're 40,000 short of what you earn. Let's say it's the same scenario now, but in this scenario, a hospital helped recruit you and they said, we're gonna give you a salary of 30,000 guarantee. So we're gonna guarantee your same salary of 30,000 and we're gonna give you 5,000 to help with some overhead expenses or a medical assistant or whatever. So they're basically guaranteeing you for 35,000 and you collect the same 15 grand. Well, then what happens is the hospital writes you a check for 20,000 to get you up to that 35,000 that you want to be at what they guaranteed. So now you're at 35,000 and you're only 20,000 shy. So what happens is you earn the same amount, but instead of being in debt, 40,000 to the group, you're only in debt, 20,000 to the group. So the guarantee helps generate extra money that the hospital is paying for because you're in theory doing cases with them, but it's reducing your debt burden to the group. And now let's say we go to the next month. And this next month, or we're four months down the road, whatever, your overhead's 25,000 still, your same salary, same monthly total liability, and your debt to the group is now 80,000 because we're a few months in and you've been in the negative. But this month, you just went insane and you collected $75,000. So the hospital doesn't pay you anything because you've exceeded the guarantee. So they're, they don't have a liability to you. And then you look at the second to bottom line, you're 20,000 over now. So you paid yourself, you paid your overhead and that extra 20,000, that goes towards your 80,000 debt. So now you only owe 60,000. So you do this a few more months and then you're totally out of debt and the whole time you were able to maintain this base salary to yourself. So that's the premise behind a salary guarantee. Again, I can't stress enough, there's a billion ways to construct the nuances, but the idea is that you maintain a steady salary while a debt builds up in the background and then you get yourself out of it by bonusing above whatever the guarantee is. Um, so then another really important thing that you wanna have, and this is important for private practice, it's extremely important for academics, is what's the path to get to where you wanna be? So if you wanna have partnership at a private group or you wanna have leadership, now there's leadership in private practice too and in hospitals, but in academia, it's super important. Most people don't go into academics because they wanna sit on the sidelines. They wanna do research, they wanna teach residents, they wanna be involved in leadership positions. And you should have an idea of what are the things I need to check off to grow into you know, an associate or a full professor. But also, if you want to be involved in the residency, don't just assume that because you're young and energetic, they're going to plug you in. You know, you have to talk to them about that in the beginning. Where do you see me going if I tell you I want to be involved in the residency or the fellowship program and give me real steps to do that, you know, if it's something that's important to you. So the, those should be spelled out pretty specifically in your contract uh, in terms of being a partner. A lot of times they are pretty simple. They'll say, have you been here for more than a year? Are you board certified? Are you debt free? And then they'll say, and we'll vote on it as a board. And if two thirds of us agree to allow you to be a partner, then you can. And maybe there's a buy-in or whatever, but that should be there pretty clearly. It shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. It should be something you're able to plan for both emotionally, mentally, and financially. And then you know, at the bottom there, stuff about research is also super important. Don't just assume because you're joining an academic department that does a ton of research that you're going to become, 
an assistant and then an associate professor and just get your own research assistant. You want that written in the contract so that they can allocate finances for that and you're not arguing for it later. Um, as I think I've said before, but it's just so, so important, before you sign the contract, almost all the time is when you have the absolute most negotiating power. For those of us that are new coming out of residency and fellowship, it's also when we feel the weakest. We're like, you know, taught to say thank you for free salting crackers and peanut butter, even the salting crackers that don't have salt on them for some reason. Like I still said thank you for those because that's what you're kind of beaten into a little bit as a resident. And when you go to sign these contracts, you're like, oh man, you're offering me more than I got paid as a resident. Like, thank you. And it's good to be appreciative, but you need to get what you need to get. And it's important that you advocate for yourself strongly when you have a negotiating position. Um, number nine, no one loves talking about this. It's definitely the most awkward part for sure. Um, but this is the part of the contract that is quite possibly the most important part of the contract. And I say that because it's the part of the contract that you write when times are good to pull out when times are bad. And remember that this, when you're signing this part of the contract and negotiating this, this is like the nicest people are ever going to be to you and probably you to them if you're ever getting to the termination standpoint. So you want to make sure that you're, you're getting a good feel. You're not pushing things too hard, but things need to be equitable. They need to be, they, this contract that's handed to you, when you think about it like this, it's not that you wrote a 20 page contract and gave it to the group and said, why don't you guys look that over and see if you want to hire me? Think about it. They wrote the contract or the academic system wrote the contract and they handed it to you, which means it was written by their attorneys to favor them. And there might be enough little crumbs in there so that you feel like it's helping you. But I would argue that unless you have a really small group of guys and girls you've known for a long time, that you probably need to change a few things in the contract to make sure that it's actually equitable for you. And by equitable, some of those things are, you know, termination without cause, for instance, is something I have here is that they might say in there, well, you have to give us 30 days notice and we'll give you 30 days notice for termination without cause, which means they can just say, we don't need you anymore. You can say, I don't want to be here anymore. Well, I probably want my employer to tell me more than 30 days in advance because I got to find a job, right? We got to interview. We, get, we need time. So you might want to argue for 120 days. And then if they say, well, that's fine. But if you want to leave without cause, you have to tell us in 120 days. Great. That's equitable. But what I don't want you to get caught up in is saying if the numbers are equal, then the equitable risk is the same because it's not true. Like imagine if Chet just took a job and he took it in Seattle. So he's way away from his whole family and he moves his wife and kids all the way up there and they get there and day one, they're like, actually, sorry, our group sucks and we're out of money and we don't have a job for you. So you're gonna have to go home in 30 days and that's all we can pay you for. The risk for that group and the risk for Chet or Dr. Donnelly is not symmetric, right? It's not even close. He's taking on way more risk by doing that. So one of the things my attorney recommended is propose a moratorium. Say we can do the 90 day equitable termination without cause, but I want a one year moratorium on you being able to tell me that. So after a year's up, it becomes totally equitable, but it helps extinguish some of the extra risk that you take on where things are unbalanced. So anywhere that there's exposure or lack of balance, that's where you wanna pay attention to. That's where your contract attorney will help highlight issues for you. Um, with contract review, you should definitely read it over on your own to see things that you want to negotiate. Um, when you involve the contract attorneys kind of up to you, like I really enjoy negotiating because I think it's like a competition and it's kind of a fun game for me. And so I like doing some of this on my own. If you're not as comfortable with that or don't like doing that, then talk to an attorney sooner. Like there is no amount of money really you're going to spend on a contract attorney that's wasted money. Uh, so you just have to use it where you feel comfortable. But like I negotiated a lot of my salary and signing bonus and student loan money and all that stuff before I got to the attorney. The important thing is just say thank you or say like, we're really moving in the right direction or I really appreciate how much you guys are helping me or it seems like you really value me or it seems like you guys really care about your employees or insert random phrase that sounds like that. What you don't wanna say is, yes, this looks excellent. I accept all the terms. Let me just have my attorney look at it. Cause you see how that totally removes your ability to negotiate. Like, don't do that. Just say, thank you, but don't ever say yes until you're ready to put a pin on the paper. So then you have the contract attorney look at it. They make sure that they look over areas for exposure, all that stuff. And they're, like I said, super helpful money. So read, I, I cannot stress this enough. I'm going to get like super painfully close. Like in a world where no one reads the Apple terms of service. And I get that you need to read your own employment contract. It is so, so, so important, okay? Every word. If you don't understand something, ask. You can ask the employer, ask your group, hey, what did you guys mean by this? And that's reasonable. They might give you what they think, 
But the end, the end of the day, it's your attorney that you need to say, hey, this is what they said. Does that make sense? And they'll say, yeah, the legalese translates to that. Or they'll say, hey, they should actually spell it out. The last thing I'll point on this slide, a verbal contract is worth as much as the paper it's written on. I've heard that like a billion times in my life. Could not be more true. In court, if something happens and someone's suing someone and you say, well, he said this, they're going to say, show us the page where it says that, right? If it's not written down, it doesn't matter. And if they believe it, they shouldn't have a problem writing it down. So don't feel awkward asking someone to write it down. So this is one of the best books I've ever read. Uh, it is incredible. I highly recommend everyone anywhere in the world uh, listen to this. This guy was the head hostage negotiator for the FBI for 20 years. Um, he really explains how to negotiate, how to put people on your team. And what you end up doing is you take the person you're negotiating with and you, and you put yourself on the same team against the contract. And when you're able to do that and manipulate the situation, uh, you'll be able to come out on top almost all the time, both with jobs and with buying things on Facebook Marketplace, which I'll give another talk on later. Um, my uh, contract attorney there is Ezra. There are a ton of really good ones. I'm certain of that, but I'm also 100% certain he's phenomenal. He didn't waste my time. Uh, and he gave me some stuff for this talk, which was very nice of him. But I've sent about 15 people to him already. I uh, hope to send a lot more because I just think he's a good human being and uh, won't waste your money, energy, or time and will give you good advice. Um, so with that, my email is at the top. Please fee feel free to email me any questions that you have. Obviously, I'm on uh, Instagram a lot too. Uh, and try and respond to those messages. But um, it's kind of a scary time when you're getting ready to do the contract stuff, but don't be intimidated by it. Just remember, don't say yes until you're ready to sign it with the paper and that gives you room to keep moving. Dr. Burleson, thanks for a great talk. Just gonna take a breath here for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're going to open it up to Q&A. So if any of the participants have any questions, please send them over in the chat box or otherwise let me know. Um, I have a few questions. So since Dr. Burleson was just talking about contracts and we're kind of in that mindset, I had a question about tail coverage for people who may not be familiar with that. So one of the things that I looked at in contracts is malpractice insurance. And I believe Texas is a state or, that has tort reform. Uh, Georgia is not where I practice and I actually don't know about Tennessee. And one of the issues is when you purchase your malpractice insurance, but then you leave that practice, what happens if you get sued a year later? And who is paying for that malpractice insurance? So a lot of people call that tail coverage. And in my mind, it's an issue because if you decide to leave a practice, you might owe $100,000 in tail coverage. So Dr. Burleson, would you mind talking a little bit about that and informing the group? Yeah, so that's that's absolutely a really important thing. That unfortunately, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so that's exactly what tail coverage is. Um, that should be in your contract in terms of what happens in different scenarios. And it's normally scenario driven. So for instance, I'll just tell you my contract because this is not a violation of things I can't disclose is that if I am fired with cause because I'm, I don't know, I use a bunch of heroin and go to work, then they're going to, they're going to charge me the tail coverage on the way out the door. If, if I, uh, if they let me go without cause, um, then they will pay for it. Or if I leave because I had cause to leave, like they did something wrong to me, then they will pay for it. Um, and if I leave on my own, then what I did is the contract started with, well, if I leave without cause, then I have to pay for it. That's what they sent to me. And I said, well, hold on. What if I'm 30 years in and I, you know, just want to be done operating or whatever. I don't think I should have to pay all that. And so they agreed with that. So when they agree with that point, then I just keep sliding it back until I get pushed back. So then I'm like, well, what if I leave around retired 20 years? And I'm like, ah, that's maybe reasonable. I'm like, what if I were retired three years? And they're like, well, that's not reasonable. So then we find a time where... We basically made a payoff. So by five years, if I leave without cause, then they pick up the whole thing. And so i made a sliding scale. Uh, and Tennessee is very close to Texas in terms of tort reform, uh, which is something we don't talk about enough in training, but is super important. Basically it just means in Texas, the rule is you can sue someone after a bad outcome for $250,000 of pain and suffering is the, I believe is the max. And then all the cost of the medical bills, which is you know reasonable, but they can't you can't pick a number out of the sky. Like in Massachusetts, they could sue me for twenty million dollars for you know looking at them the wrong way, and I'd have to spend money to defend that if they chose to pursue it and the judge took it. Um, so there is a benefit to being in a tort reform state. Malpractice insurance tends to be a lot cheaper as a result. 
Yeah, I think those are all great points. I think when you talk about the debt that you owe a practice in private practice, I think that, you know, the statistics is 50% of people change jobs at the two year mark. And if you're someone who just wants to change your job voluntarily, you should just really know what you're signing as far as who pays back any debt if you have that and uh, if you owe them for uh, your tail coverage, because that could make a very expensive exit um, up, upward of six figures. So thanks. That's right. Great. Dr. Donnelly, so two questions about technology that maybe are related. So one is, do you have a favorite kind of new technology? And then where do you think, what new technologies do you think are going to be established or dare I say standard of care in 10 years versus what do you think are just trendy things that may fade away. And how do you as a surgeon tell the difference when you're looking to be an early adopter? That's a good question. So I think things, we've even seen some, you know, in our own short career, I remember starting residency, we were putting in a lot of co-flexes and they seemed great and not knocking those. But now I bet both you and John take out more of those than you put in, for instance. And at the time, those were great because you know, the big hot buzzword is non-fusion procedure where you're putting in metal, essentially. It's probably not the buzzword necessarily, but anything you can do to get the patient to move less without fusing them. And I don't think we're going to be there yet. I think the closest thing we got is uh, tethering in a way. And, you know, that sounds like probably the newest, hottest technology that hopefully works. That's not really in any of our wheelhouses. I don't think any of us are doing AIS or PD Scully. Uh I think that'd be kind of the newest technology along the same lines of non-fusion surgeries, kind of where the future is going. There's a lot of neat, fancy things out there like that top system, but I definitely wouldn't put too much stock into that yet. I hope no one finds this clip in like 10 years and be like, ha, see, it was, it was God's gift to man. See, but, and I think that that just speaks to how hard it is to tell, you know, what's going to stand the test of time. Anyway, please continue. Yeah, exactly. Probably someone in, you probably find a clip like 30 years ago. So I was like, oh, pedicle screw. That's going to be crazy. That's never going to work. And <laughs> look at us now. So, you know, it is hard to tell. I guess the thing is, I don't plan on being the newest high-tech innovator. Maybe 20 years from now, I can be that. But I think at this point now, the key thing for young surgeons is don't try to be the famous new person using the hottest technology. Kind of do what your other partners are doing and do it what you're comfortable with and what's still safe. Yeah, that all makes great sense to me. It, hey, well, Chet, one more question. Did you, when you went there to practice after your fellowship, you know, you guys had the uh, Globot and then, you know, you go to practice. Was that, A, was that a consideration on where you were going? I, I know you kind of knew the area. And then B, if it was or wasn't, do you, did you have to negotiate for any of the technology as part of your initial contract? Was it already there? Like, what was your situation? Um, mine, since I was like a private practice spine only group, we were kind of, kind of could go anywhere we want in the entire city to operate. And so the place I go to use my robot is med city Frisco, which I think you've probably been to a yeah. ton of times. And they're kind of the only one in town that have the robot. And you know, if other place closer to either where I live or where I practice had it, I'd probably do even more robotic cases. And I tell them that all the time, like if you guys get a robot, I'll take hundred percent of my robot cases to your hospital instead. So it wasn't really negotiated. And I kind of tell them I'm not trying to be, the champion for having them spend like 1.3 or $4 million just on my behalf. But my kind of thing I've been working with is trying to talk to a couple other young surgeons in our shoes to see like, Hey, if we each think we'll do like three ish robot cases here a month and that could add up to 10 to 12 and then the hospital would buy it. So I think if you don't have it, just as you said, the best way to get it in the beginning is to have your hospital try to buy it for you. I think that's a, you know, much more about that than I do, but probably your next option too, that might be more realistic, might be less, is just kind of know your market, get a couple young surgeons with you and all kind of commit to one hospital that you guys all like and can right. maybe guarantee like 10-ish robot cases at that hospital and then it's worth their while. Awesome question, because I think about it every day right now, is uh, how do you, uh, what advice do you have for younger surgeons, especially like the three of us, during board selections for new technology? I would not use anything too crazy during that six month board. Cause you gotta think about the people doing your board examinations. I always reference are kind of the Frank Eisman's of the world who are in their mid seventies and 
do really well with what they know. And if I'm coming out there trying to say, oh, I did a augmented reality prone lateral with perk screws and the top system of it, well, that's <laughs> I've ever heard. You could have done it a lot cheaper, safer using this stuff. So I think, you know, again, when I'm talking about technology, I'm not trying to argue about the new gimmicky product. I would just stick away from those for the first several years. I would focus more on the uh, telemarketing. I know that's a, or, sorry, telemedicine aspect of new technology. Robots kind of established. That's a good way from a marketing standpoint. And it's also does provide a level of safety. There's no debate on that. And then the other thing I focus on is kind of the surgical approaches. ALIF is, was at one point considered a new surgical approach and was considered cutting edge and crazy at the time. Now it's standard of care. Same thing with, um, with lateral approaches. Now lateral approaches are very standard. So I think there's a whole nother debate and I don't know the answers doing a lateral, even in the lateral position, um, a little hairy for boards. I don't think it is. I know I've talked to some people that say that they're not doing any laterals during boards. So I think yeah. in terms of that aspect, that's something I don't know the answer to. And hopefully I don't find out the hard way. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say you and you and I together will be repeating next year. If that's the yeah. I was like, I think laterals are good, but I've talked to people who say, man, I can't believe you're doing laterals during boards. And I don't know. I feel like I guess it depends on where, where you train and what you've seen and what you're, what you feel safe with. Um, well, so thanks you know, doing, for a great session, you gentlemen. Feel good on laterals. Are you guys? Do, are you doing laterals during boards? Me? Yeah. So I am not actually, but some of that is driven by my practice locations. So I am very passionate about working with what I would consider sometimes underserved populations. So I work one at a county hospital, and then also at the Atlanta VA, and. My plan coming in was to establish like safe, successful, open surgery. So we are there. And so now I'm starting to do some more percutaneous techniques or things like that. But uh, I really wanted to start with the solid foundation of successful open surgery because there's a lot, there's a lot of moving parts and anything I can do to eliminate variables is in my favor because there's so many variables every case. Um, and for me, eliminating one of the variables was doing a lot of like perk or lateral and just yep, kind of for sure. stuff. And also at one of my hospitals, I do about 90% trauma and certainly laterals can come in handy for trauma. Um, but generally I've been treating those more traditional. Yeah, treatments. that's very So yeah, that's my thing for the younger surgeons coming out just to, echo what Dr. Ziegler was asking, you know, I wouldn't be using new technology in terms of implants. I would kind of just stick away from those, even if they are God's gift to man, just hold off for maybe a year or two, kind of let other people more established with more credibility, uh, establish those and let papers come out on some of the newer implants. But in terms of approaches and even the things that we know are going to be good and safe, like telemedicine, I know it's silly to call that a technology, but that's something we weren't using two years ago and now is rampant. Um, that's something just key things to focus on and kind of separate yourself and try to connect more patients, more providers, and more PCPs. All right. Well, thanks everyone for a great session. All right. Thanks everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks guys. Thanks. Have a great night.